Johnny Walker invites you to walk with giants. Take an inspirational walk with some of the greatest striding men on earth. Hi, there. this is uh, Robert Carlyle. You're walking with me today in my old neck of the woods here in Glasgow. I hope you've got your thermos with you because it is freezing here today. It must be at least 25 below. This area played a huge part in my life. And what I want to do today is take you for a wee walk and tell you basically where I came from and where I went to. It's actually very unusual for me to speak about pretty much anything from my past. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is, uh, is never been heard before. And I think it's important for me to do this for a number of reasons, but the biggest reason of all is my father, God bless him, he passed away four years ago. When he was gone, it suddenly occurred to me that no one else knew this story other than me. And if I was to suddenly get hit by a bus tomorrow, my children would have no idea about where I had come from, where my father had came from, where my grandparents had came from. So this seemed to me to be a worthwhile thing to do. The first thing you should know about me is, um, when I was three years old, my mother left me and my father. And that was traumatic, obviously, for my father. My father suffered a nervous breakdown, in fact, at that time in his life. He had come from a stock standard working class background in Glasgow, but he's a wee shirt and tie man. He worked very hard, my father. But when the marriage ended, he went on a kind of spiral and took me off with him in what was quite an incredible journey. So the first seven years of my life were spent in the East End of Glasgow. And the East End of Glasgow was a particularly hard and rough place to be. We had less than nothing, we were poorer than poor. So, as this wee story I'm telling you is all about walking, about my journey, we really began walking <laughs> from the age of three or four. We would walk for miles and miles looking for anything we could find. I'll tell you this story. I remember particularly to show how hard this was. Brookborn tea packets used to have little stamps. And if you saved up enough of these on a little card, you could get a box of groceries. So we would spend literally months raking through dustbins, trying to find tea packets that still had a stamp. Whenever we would be wandering, and we would come upon a skip, my heart would kind of sink because I knew my dad would find something in there to dust in and to sell on. And it didn't really matter what that was. My wee dad would get the water when he's back. I would be helping him. And along we would go back to this absolute gutter that we lived in. Why were we so poor? Why was my dad not working? Well, I have to tell you, simply because he had to look after me. There was no option, there was no family. When my mother and father's marriage broke up, my father's family kind of rejected him. So he had no backup, he had nothing at all. And of course, the notion of the single parent family, even then, was very vague. So there was a certain element of distrust towards my father from social security type institutions and stuff that were continually trying to take me away. And my father would then move from address to address, basically to escape. Um, I have to be, be honest, we survived through stealing a lot of the time, you know. He would nick stuff, uh, he would sell it on and that would keep us going for a week or two. It was living on your wits, you know, it was very much living on your wits. My father was brilliant at that. He did some things which are quite extraordinary and this is maybe the first indication of any sense of acting in my life. What my dad used to do is he would take me to what was called the welfare and um, he would say to me on the way, I'm going to make a bit of a scene here, I'm going to scream and shout a lot, I'm going to threaten to leave you, but don't worry son, I'll be coming back to get you. Now these institutions then were grim, I mean it was Dickensian almost, you know, and you would sit there and be humiliated basically and at the end of the day, you would get, again, a box of groceries. But trying to get that was like trying to scale the eiger. So uh, several times my dad would do that, he would take me and he'd say, look, 
we need this, we need money, we can't give you money, Mr. Khalil. Okay, you take them. I remember seeing these people laugh, going, don't be ridiculous, what are you talking about? That's your son. Saying, well, it is my son, but I can't really look after him anymore. It's up to you. Bye. And he's off. And my dad was like a greyhound, right? Out the door and away. And I would be sitting there watching this. And even though I know he's coming back, he's so convincing that I think he's away. At the time, it just seemed like everything was against us, you know? Me and my dad against the world. That was all it was. My mother, in actual fact, made a reappearance when I was about six years old. And I remember sitting at home with my dad, and this woman walked in, and she had a fur coat on. It'd only been three years, but I didn't know her. And my dad said, that's your mum. And I just remember her coming up to me and covering me up in her, this fur coat. And I remember the feeling of the fur, the smell of the perfume. And even though I was just a wee boy, six years, I remember feeling happy. And you know, I thought she was back for six months. And I've only found out in recent times that she's actually only back for two weeks. I wish I could ask them now. If you've got anything you want to ask your parents, ask them before they go, because once they go, they're gone. The film Monty, um, I'm obviously grateful for my entire career. What struck me was, I think I was 32 when the Monty came up. I think my father was around about the same age when his marriage started to fall apart and he had me. And I suppose then was my first real indication to me of how much my father loved me. He'd have done anything for me, he'd have killed for me. But I suddenly began to get it. And of course, Gaz in the film Monty would do anything for his wee boy. He eventually takes his clothes off in public. But, you know, if... Oh, I'm sorry, that's my agent. <laughs> So there comes a point where my father decides that it's time to leave the East End of Glasgow. There was such an atmosphere of violence and my father could see that even at the early, early age, six or seven, that I was getting pulled into that. And I remember seeing these vicious, ferocious gangs squaring up to each other. Now, it was like the charge of the light brigade. Us as wee boys would be underneath cars inside tenement doorways watching all this. And I remember seeing this boy, I don't know what eventually happened, but I just seen this massive blade aiming down towards this guy's arm and it certainly hit him. I'll never forget the scream that came out of this guy. And I was really shocked by that and it was very, very soon after that and my dad thought, right, we're getting out of here. And we ended up in the West End of Glasgow, which was certainly a much more peaceful area to live. <laughs> Just looking at a dog there, a very typical Glasgow Collie there. Give me my ball or I'll bite you. I do tend to divide my childhood into darkness and light. And the first seven years was certainly the darkness. Uh, the west end of Glasgow was in Technicolor. It was brighter than bright. And as we're walking along here at Botanic Gardens, this is kind of where it all began for me. My dad was rubbish at all other aspects of his financial life, but he was pretty good at paying the rent. But uh, what had happened was that the landlord hadn't showed up. Two or three weeks went by. I always remember this man, his name was Mr Makulu, and uh, he was reputedly from Nigeria. But uh, something had happened with his life back home, and Mr Makulu was gone. And suddenly this Victorian townhouse was left abandoned. We had been in houses before that, little sh crummy houses. This was the first time we were actually in a bed sit. Even my dad didn't really know what this was. I certainly didn't know what this was. There was other people in this house, but we didn't necessarily talk to them. So, my dad started to chat the doors. And each door that was opened up, the people were more colourful and kind of spectacular in their own kind of way. And they kind of looked at him and said, so you're the father of the kid? Yes. Where's the mother? She's gone. So my dad and me became celebrities within this house. Coming through the East End, struggling to eat. Uh, me and my father survived for a week on custard powder made with water. I can't even tell you what that's like. Try it yourself, because a translucent orange kind of colour. I remember eating this slop. Now, we came for that to Belmont Street and suddenly it was like, 
my father had a family. An interesting thing. <laughs> this makes me laugh anyway, to show you how bizarre that the world I'd stepped in. And remember coming through this darkness of the east end of Glasgow. Suddenly we're in the west end in this house and there's a couple there called Roger and Rosemary. And Roger and Rosemary had a chameleon. Imagine that as a wee boy, you think this is incredible. They morph, they change their colour and stuff like that. And I used to sit staring at this chameleon for hours and hours and hours trying to see it change into the colour of the wallpaper. And of course, it escaped. <laughs> and I always kind of thought, I wonder what happened to that wee chameleon. Maybe it met another kind of lizard and they started a wee family and there's loads of kind of strange chameleon type creatures crawling about Glasgow suddenly. So it was fun. 1966-67 had happened, the summer of love had taken place. And the whispers of this new kind of life was sweeping its way across the ocean. And my father embraced this. He started to listen to Dr Timothy Leary. He turned on, he tuned in and he dropped out. And within a year, the collar and tie was gone. His hair was right down to his bum, in fact. His beard grew down to his chest. And all the people that run about me looked like that. And here we were, we were suddenly getting called hippies. There was other women in there, you see. Mothers and daughters. So suddenly I was looking in the mirror. I had friends for the first time. And my dad, for the first time in many, many years, he could actually leave me with people and go on with his life a wee bit. He started doing a bit of painting and decorating and stuff like that. Making a wee bit of money. But of course, you know, all good things come to an end and the days of Belmont Street were nearly over. Mr McCullough's house was going to be sold, squatter's rights. They couldn't kick you out if somebody was in the house. This one particular day, everybody was out. People came and locked the whole place up. We were on the street again. <laughs> well, en masse, we decided we were going to go to London because one of the guys in the commune knew this guy called Dingo who owned a townhouse on Ifield Road in Chelsea that he'd won in a card game. So the whole bunch is about 20, went and lived in this beautiful but dilapidated townhouse in Chelsea. And if there was colourful people in the Glasgow commune, you can imagine what I was confronted with in London. Buddhists, Jamaicans, people that I'd never seen before in my life. That lasted a couple of years and we moved again en masse down to Brighton. And everything I'm telling you is true. On my children's life, all of this is true. We slept on Brighton Beach for about 18 months. There must have been about maybe 50, 60 people that were sleeping on the beach underneath this pier. And when it rained, what my dad used to do is he used to wrap me up in plastic bags like a crispy roll. And he'd carry me up to the prom pull back the canvases which was covering up the deck chairs and he'd stick me in there and that would be me for the night. I can remember me and my dad walking for miles to the cinema that let you in for lemonade bottles. He always said that he did this to take my mind off the fact that my mother wasn't around. It was probably to take his mind off it as much as anybody else's. And my dad would take me to see any movie I wanted to see as long as it was a western. And that love of westerns and cowboys has stayed with me my entire life. I loved the idea of the man in black riding into town. Nobody knew who he was. Nobody knew where he came from. And you always knew that he was going somewhere that you never knew quite where he was going. I still love that notion. And I think that's actually reflected in an awful lot of my work. You see, my story and the story I'm telling you today I can laugh about this to now, but see at the time, I was ashamed, I didn't like my story. So the cowboys and the world that they inhabited seemed to me to be much, much better story to tell. And one of my early pieces actually was a character called Hamish Macbeth. Now if ever there was a cowboy, there he was. And I was even able to dress him in black. <laughs> he became Yul Brynner to me, Hamish Macbeth. How do I explain to you how I became an actor? At 16 years old, suddenly I was confronted with reality, which is what are you going to do now? I was a butcher for a morning. 
I worked in an ironmonger's for a couple of months. I worked on the buses of one of the last of the Clippies bus conductors in Glasgow. And then, 19 years old was my birthday, and someone had got me some book tokens. So this is the book that I wanted. It was called Hollywood the Pioneers. I had 75 pence left over in this book token. And beside the Hollywood the Pioneers book, there was drama scripts. And as I was looking along, I seen this one called The Crucible. And I thought, why do I know that? I know this was somewhere, and I'd remembered it from school. I also had remembered the name Arthur Miller. This goes back again into the commune <laughs> days. There's a, there's a Glasgow dog attacking us as we walk. How, how respectful is that? Um, <laughs> the Crucible. I thought, I remember that. I was thinking it was a book. I thought, well, I'll get that, and I took this, this script. First one I'd ever looked at. And at that point, I'm 19, I'm getting quite politicised. This was about the McCarthy witch hunts in America in the 50s. This guy has been able to disguise what he's actually talking about and take it to Salem. I thought, how absolutely fantastic to actually be one thing but pretend you're another. I cannot tell you how big a moment that was in my life. That I've never been to the theatre. And a friend of mine said, well, why don't you go and see some plays then? You know, maybe you'll enjoy it. And there was a place called the Citizens Theatre. And I would go and I'd seen all these wonderful plays that I had no knowledge of. And so in a period of about two years, I became quite literate in terms of drama. Um, something which I would thought, well, that just ain't for me. But there was an ad in the paper for this place called the Glasgow Arts Centre. They were going to do some plays and stuff like that. And I remember going in for the first night in a room of about 100 people all screaming and shouting, trying to look at me, 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 me. I nearly turned in my heel and walked right out. But I persevered and I sat there and about six months went by and this wonderful woman called Maggie Kinloch, she came up to me one day and she said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I just, you know, just coming for the drama. She said, well, are you? You just sat there, you're not doing anything. And she was really harsh. I thought, OK, I need to do something here. And it took about another month or so to pluck up the courage. The very first thing I did, I made people laugh. And in actual fact, I could see myself shaking. And from that point, everything changed in my head. I started to think, you might actually be quite good at this. And Maggie Kinloch and another guy called Robin Wilson, they said to us, why don't you try for drama school? And this is the very beginnings of me having a bit of determination to, to hold on to this accent that you can hear here. Because from the minute I walked into drama school, I was told, if you continue to talk like that, you're never going to work. And this was just horrific as far as I was concerned. There was only about three Scots in actual fact in the year. Two other boys for Glasgow, one boy for Castle Milk, which is a hard area. And he did it. One day, he was speaking like me, Next day he came in and he started to talk like that. So I had so many fights over the next three years with the lecturers and with the tutors in there. But I was determined to make it work. I'm not going to run away with my tail between my legs any longer. I'm going to face it, I'm going to front it, and I'm going to pursue this career in the way that I see fit. So what does the future hold? What do you think? I guess, you know, the thing to, to, to say to you is, is that honesty, believability, Dynamic. Things can get put in your way which take you further and further away from that, that target. So whether you want to become a bricklayer or whether you want to become an athlete, then you have to remember what is true and what is honest and what is valid. <laughs> you know, one of the great directors I've worked with, Danny Boyle. Danny Boyle's greatest quality is his enthusiasm for anything that you give him. I've lost count the amount of times during train spotting on the beach and uh, 28 weeks later, in fact, that we cut because Danny was laughing because he was enjoying it so much. See, when somebody gives you that pat in the back, everybody needs it. Doesn't matter how confident you are, you need a slap in the back. Danny was great for that. And so if I seen a wee 16-year-old Robert Carlyle walking up this path to the i stick my arm on his shoulder, I'd squeeze him and say, son, go for it.
I guess if I've got any role to play, I think I have to give a voice to the people who don't have a voice. Thinking back to my childhood, the wee guy for the East End of Glasgow, this wee guy who was nothing. Well, I've made a career out of playing guys who are less than nothing. You know, when you're, you're thinking about, is it possible for someone to come from nowhere? Then the answer is absolutely yes, but I tell you this, don't think back. Thinking back can tie you up in knots and make you doubt yourself. Keep going forward, keep that water moving. The one person who stuck by me all the way through to the very beginning was my father. And you know what he did? This was many years later. I think I had done Phil Monty, Transport, even Bond by this point, things had come to fruition. And I was sitting with my dad one night and he said, you're doing quite well, son, eh? I was like, aye, aye, things are going all right, dad. He said, well, you know, he said, look, and he, and he pulled this bank boot out of his pocket. And I look at it and it's got £3,000 in it. He said, when you decided to give up the painting and go into the acting, I wasn't sure whether it was going to happen for you or not. So I saved you up a wee bit of money in case it didn't work out. I was going to get you a wee van, a wee set of ladders, some brushes, and you'd be on your way. And I'm pausing now, even thinking about that. That you would do something like that for me, you know? I said to him, I say I'm da, I genuinely don't need the money anymore. By this point, I've already bought my da a house. <laughs> you know? I was like, Daddy, just spend it. And that was, I think, one of the most beautiful things that anyone could ever do for anyone, for, certainly for a father, for a son. I, I really want to say, my father was, uh, was a very, very honest man. And to me, if that is all you leave behind in your life, that's a wonderful, rich thing to leave behind. And that is, I hope, something that I can pass on to my children. My children are everything. I love them more than is healthy. And I want everything for them. Family's the important thing to me. I never had one. I want to make the best family I can possibly make. Well, this is us coming to the end of our walk together. But I have to say, I've enjoyed this today. Believe it or not, this is four years today my father passed away. So I really hope that it means something to you. It certainly means something to me. I'm going to head off now. But wherever you're going, keep walking and have a good one. Walk with other giants at johnnywalker.com.